How you guys doing? Good. Hey, who here uh, enjoys mowing their lawn? Good Midwestern question, right? About a third of the... I was talking to our GM for this business the other day, and I, I said I just finally hired someone to mow my lawn, and he's like, I had children to do that. And I was like, congratulations on finding the most complex, expensive way to get that job done. Um, how about cleaning your house? Who here enjoys cleaning their house? I'm with you. I actually don't mind the cleaning because ultimately, I think it's kind of this therapeutic thing. It's not complex and crazy like a lot of our technical lives are. We're going to talk about a lot of different things regarding the value of experts to your business. And I'll, I'll be up front. You know, we're, we're here with Rackspace Fanatical Support for AWS. We have an offer in this space. I'm going to do everything I can to make it not pure product shill because I know that gets very old very fast. But we probably are going to push that line, full transparency. Um, everyone here can mow their lawn if you choose to. Everyone here can clean your house. But the deal is, for the majority of us, our time is better spent doing something else. It's not that we're not able, it's not that we're not willing, it's that for the most part, it's not the best use of our time. The majority of businesses, as we've entered this space, let me back up just a little bit, Rackspace is all about finding what technologies our customers want. Apparently, if you step on that cord, it makes that sound. Um, what Rackspace has been all about historically is finding technologies that our company, that companies that we work with want to use, building expert teams, and then applying those expert teams to our customers' problems. And I guess problems might be the wrong word because the fact that my grass is growing is a good thing. The fact that it needs to be cut is also a good thing. I just don't want to do it. So whatever your core business is, ultimately, there is block and tackle work. There's really two categories. There's block and tackle work associated with your core business. Things that are undifferentiated, that just flat out have to get done for you to have healthy workloads. There's a lot of that in cloud. So for, for those of you operating cloud at scale today, I mean, who disagrees with that statement that there is a lot of undifferentiated block and tackle work associated with having a healthy cloud workload? Does anyone here disagree with that statement? Good, I got one right. Uh, the, uh, the other part of it is extracting the best out of systems that have the, pay, the kind of pace of innovation that AWS has. It really has two different, two different facets if you think about it critically. Number one, they already have this massive service catalog. So whenever you enter the ecosystem, there's a ton for you to get educated on to understand how you can extract the most value from it. If you're at reInvent, you saw they launched Kinesis Firehose. If you go to the keynote today, there's already enhancements to Kinesis Firehose. I bet there's a lot of companies out there going, what's Kinesis Firehose? And they're already innovating on it. This is a great thing. So from Rackspace's point of view, we have a great partner because their pace of innovation is extreme. At one point earlier in the year, there were more feature enhancements released by AWS than there were days in that year that had elapsed so far. Great. I'm sure everybody in this room who's on the platform loves that. So ultimately, what you need teams of experts for is to solve for those things that you have deemed to be the kind of work that you may not feel it's necessary to have people on your staff doing directly. So generally, I find that when people ask me what I do for a living, I ask, I ask them, do you enjoy mowing your own lawn? And we kind of go down the same thing. So ultimately, it's, a, it's an oversimplified analogy for what we're trying to accomplish with fanatical support for AWS. And ultimately, in answer to the question, why, what is the value of certified experts to your business? Wow, we got, this thing got butchered moving over from a Mac. That's fine, I think we can all still read it. I apologize for the formatting. We usually like to keep our game pretty tight. So if you're not familiar with Rackspace, $2 billion public company, operate worldwide. We've been in business with AWS for about 190 days now. We've gone from a team of zero certified experts, people with those, those pro and associate certs, to over 290 of them now in about six months. And the point of that is because for that kind of work, when you think if you are a business owner here, if you're a business unit leader, if you're an owner, CTO, CIO, results of your business are on you. It's you are responsible for the outcomes. The inputs, you have plenty of teams to do that, but you're responsible for the outcomes. That's ultimately where we focus. And ultimately, some of the big buckets we think about 
places that you feel like you absolutely have to have experts. Getting to AWS, if you weren't native, building your application in AWS, you probably have some applications that when you move them to a cloud platform, not only are you moving service catalogs, but you're also changing how you think about operations. Legacy IT operations, established model IT operations, a nicer way to say it, are a very different thing than cloud operations. There's different aspects of things you have to be careful of. So one other thing you can think about, not just the did I mow my lawn, but did I mow it well, like do you believe that operating a serverless architecture is the same thing as operating architectures based on EC2? Those are totally different things. So you have to comprehend, now I have Lambda on my mind since we had our conversation right after lunch. Um, you have to keep in mind, like, what does it mean to get to the cloud, and do I have people that truly understand what that means that can help me get there? Great place for experts. The second bit, when it comes to building out these architectures, it's really difficult to separate the concept of migration from the concept of architecture. And we actually have one of our certified architects here who's gonna to talk to you in a minute about what some of our customer success looks like. And we've abstracted some of the names. A lot of our customers, they don't want people to know that they've made the decision to not hire experts, as you can probably understand. Uh, but we're gonna talk about it in the general case. So architecting, is not just a one-time activity, and it's not only associated with getting to the cloud. Your needs will evolve over time. So do you want to locate and retain certified architects? Do you want to build expert teams within your enterprise to do that work for you, when in many cases, you could consider that work to be undifferentiated? It's very specific to your enterprise, however, because a standard architecture is rarely going to be a finishing point for anyone's workload. Even if you said, I need three tiers so I can do e-com, and I wanna have horizontal scaling that's purely based on just trigger events out of like infrastructure triggers, even then, you're still gonna do some level of customization specifically for your workload. That's where architects come in. If it's net new, you wanna build things correct from the beginning. If you're migrating, you're probably gonna to need to refactor for what the capabilities of AWS are. Great place for experts. I don't even think I need to get into why you need to have experts to help you with security. For this, security is a marketer's dream because ultimately, that's a place where everyone feels that they are under-equipped to deal with the problem. So that's a great place where you can bring people in. Not only, I mean, there, there's two lenses to think through security. The first is, how do I secure my application? How do I build it so that I've minimized my number of points of possible penetration? How do I architect for security? But then there's also an operational element to security where there's a 24 seven day by day kind of thing going on where you're having to look at logs, get some kind of pattern recognition around potential threats. There's, there's a lot of different places where you absolutely need the help of experts there to make sure that unless you choose to do it yourself, now this is a great place you can apply expertise. And then the last bit, operations. It's two o'clock in the morning on Thanksgiving, you really aren't all that interested in logging in and figuring out a disk full problem. I don't think that that's even, that, that's not even specific to AWS. No one is interested in handling the esoteria of managing cloud platforms. So that's a great place to employ experts as well because you're really entrusting your business to them. One of the things, when, when we began this business, we recognized that you know, we could make a claim about being the leader in this space purely based on our, our book of business, on our, our, our history, our track record. But ultimately, third-party data is always better than things you say about yourself. You'd much rather have somebody else say Tom's a great guy as opposed to Tom saying it. That's a little bit weird. So ultimately, we've, we've had Gartner validation for what we do for our business, being the leader in our space, all of us are here to talk about things in an AWS lens. It's very clear that AWS has a leadership space and infrastructure as well. Pairing these two together makes a lot of sense. That's why our approach was very applicable here. Building up teams of experts paired with the world's leading cloud infrastructure is just a great match. So I'll go through this pretty quick. Ultimately, like we have this huge book of experts that are able to help with primarily focused on these four areas, migration, architecture, security, and operations. And there's two expressions of that. There's a lot of different ways you can think about how you want help if you're looking to engage expert teams. So MSPs can really be the kind that are available, like the, the full spectrum I would, I would say is, we're available when you need us, so that when you get stuck you have a backstop. 
all the way to I want to opt out of this operations game altogether and I don't want to build expert teams, but yet I want access to their acumen. So we found a couple of sweet spots where we've built offers. Navigator is our offer where basically you as a customer have made a decision that you want to engage experts as you need them, but you don't want to take on the headcount of having them on your staff, locating them, retaining them, keeping their skill set up. Uh, but you, you do want to have access to them and you need them. In addition to that, you also want your partner to make it easier for you to take on the operational work. So take some of the edge off of doing operations, the things I don't consider differentiating for my business, and give me access to experts when I need more of a hand than I might normally need. That's our Navigator offer. The full expression of access to experts when you need it is Aviator. What we do with Aviator is basically we carry you through all four phases of that migrate, architecture, secure, and operate. Uh, and that's where Jerry's gonna get into some of the architecture bits of this, but if you wanna opt out completely of that operational work, you wanna take on a partner to do that stuff for you, you obviously wanna do it with someone who not only claims they have the acumen and the track record, but also your infrastructure partner, Amazon, you want them to also say, we vouch for these guys. Hence, we've built up our team of AWS certified experts, over 270 associate architects and 22 pro certs. Available 24-7, 365, with all the benefits that if you want to run it yourself, you still get access to the tooling. So those are really the bookends of how you would engage Rackspace as an MSP. So some really specific examples of places that we can help, like who, uh, who here makes use of uh, AWS Trusted Advisor? They're trying to take a look at the health of their workloads. I saw one hand in the back here. I doubt it's just one person. There we go, we got a couple more. Good, a very interactive session. I'm trying to keep, a, keep the blood sugar up here. Um, what, one of the tools we've made is called Compass, and basically we think of AWS in the, in, in the environment level as opposed to just the individual account. So a great practice is to understand any potential deviations of your workloads from what is recommended as the well-architected standard uh, and best practices from AWS. If you use Trusted Advisor, you can point that against one, count, one account. It'll talk to you about all the potential deviations or problem it sees within the scope of one account. So with Fanatical support for AWS, we've built account federation and a, a method by which we manage credentials. And ultimately, what those do for you is we apply Compass against entire environments because by having secure credential vaults, we can run Trusted Advisor plus a set of recommendations that we believe are value add based on having our team of experts uh, against all of your different workloads and give you one unified view of everything that could be a potential deviation against a well-architected standard. So it's tools like that that makes it easier for you to manage your own workloads and that's the value of having access to experts via a managed service partner. So at this point, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop and turn it over to Jerry. Uh, Jerry, you wanna come up? This is Jerry Hargrove. Uh, Jerry actually comes to us from AWS. And uh, Jerry, you, you've got more than one cert under your belt, I believe, right? Um, yeah, I do. So I have the AWS um, Solutions Architect Professional and Associate certific Certifications the, and the Developer Certification. Yeah. So awesome. a few of them. So uh, the marketing right. gal sit down and the guy that actually right. knows something will start. Yeah. So as, as uh, Tom mentioned, Thank you um, for the introduction. My name is Jerry Hargrove. I'm a solutions architect at Rackspace, and I focus on AWS. And as you mentioned also, I came from AWS. So prior to coming here, I actually worked as a solutions architect there. Um, and what I wanted to talk about for a few minutes today are some of these case studies, success stories that we've seen with our customers at Rackspace. So, and just kind of describe for them, kind of mapping them back to those broad categories that Tom mentioned, the, uh, the migration, architecture, security, and operation of your stacks, and where we went in, worked with the customer, and identified areas where they wanted some assistance, where they didn't want to mow their own lawn, for example. They wanted us to come in and do some of that heavy lifting for them, and talk about a few of those. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. And by the way, any questions that come up during this, this can be very interactive. If you have specific questions about, well, how would this work in my environment or what would you suggest here? I'm more than, that, that's, that's part of my role as a solutions architect is to ask or to answer those types of questions. So if they come up, feel free, feel free to ask. Um, first of all, how many of you have AWS workloads now? 
I see a couple of hands, so that looks like about half. So uh, maybe some of you don't have or are looking for, uh, looking at AWS um, to move your platform. We work with a lot of, of customers. I do um, personally, whether they be small startup customers or large enterprise customers who are just moving to AWS. We also work with a lot who have existing uh, footprints in AWS who either want to uh, re-architect or add additional workloads, and so we'll, we'll go in with them. Um, this first uh, case study is, it's kind of a broad category, as, as Tom mentioned, um, we're not using actual names here, a digital media delivery workload. And so this customer came to us, they were, they were working um, on dedicated hardware, so very common, you've got your own hardware, maybe you're running in a colo, or you've got it in your own small data center, or you're running it in some other data center. Um, the point being is they had their own hardware, and but their desire was to move to AWS, but they didn't have any AWS in-house expertise. So they wanted to move to AWS, move from that dedicated hardware, and start taking advantage of some of the scalability, the availability, and the durability aspects of, of AWS. Um, they had a very small engineering team, so in this case it was sort of small, small business, uh, between startup and small business size, they had a small team. Um, they weren't really interested at that point in um, uh, training or hiring their own AWS team with AWS expertise, and so they wanted to leverage the expertise that we brought um, to the picture. Um, they also had a couple of unique problems, and, and I'll talk a little bit about this in terms of scalability. They had a commercial off-the-shelf application. Um, I think I can get that. No, maybe not. Oh, there it is. A commercial off-the-shelf application that I'll talk a little bit about in a few minutes, just about you know, scalability and availability for that. Um, and they were also working on a multi-tenant application. So they had an application that currently they, they, it was multi-tenant for them, so they had multiple customers on a workload. They also had some dedicated, inst or dedicated hardware set aside for dedicated customers as well. So we went in and, and started working with this customer, and, and part, of, part of the process that we go through when, when I go in, or any of the solutions architects go in and start working with customers, is we sit down with them to understand what their environment is. What does it look like? What does your infrastructure look like? And we work with them to map that infrastructure to AWS. So this maps to an ELB, or this maps to S3, or maybe you need to use Kinesis here. That's really our role, is to bring that AWS expertise to the table where a customer doesn't have it, and then understand their requirements and map the two together. And in this case, we, um, we worked with them, identified, you know, they had this shared environment, um, they had all of these single points of failure that, you know, if you move this to AWS, here, here are potential places where it's going to break. So if this fails, your entire, um, your entire system goes down, whether that be an individual uh, server or a database itself. So I did, helping, to, helping them to identify those, uh, those points that we wanted to work on. Um, the servers themselves were these commercial off-the-shelf software. Um, they didn't have any horizontal scaling capabilities. So imagine some legacy software that you have running that it, it, we can't make stateless, um, or you don't have access to the source code to make changes to it. So when you move it to the cloud, you really move it as is, and it essentially becomes a singleton application where you can't have multiples of them running at the same time. So there are cases where we have to deal, um, where we have to. Uh, deal with that. We also found in this case, and this is very common too, so you're running, a, um, you're running an application on your own hardware, you've likely over-provisioned it, and, and rightfully so, because you need to be planning six months or a year down the road. I, I don't want to buy hardware every two months. I need to have enough hardware to uh, handle my expected demand over the course of the next year. And so we, we worked with them on that too. Also, and as I mentioned in the last bullet point here, this is sort of an environment on a box. So you have one box, you have one instance, it has the application, the business logic, the database, everything on it. So it's a big, huge single point of failure. And so we encounter these types of environments uh, fairly frequently. And it, it's sort of, um, there's sort of this evolution of applications in, in um, in the cloud, and, and this is not very, how many of you have ever had an environment like this where you essentially have a microservice or a complete environment on a single box, database, application, everything? 
Good. I, I see quite a few hands. It's, it's very common whether that you're a small startup and this is coming from somebody's garage. They had a PC. They had it running. All of a sudden, you go into production. Somebody says, OK, we just need to turn this on, repoint DNS at um, this application. And then all of a sudden, this, this is where you're at. You're right. You've got one application on a box, and it's running. And so in terms of the evolution of architecture in AWS, this is very commonly what, what, what we see when we're working with customers. Step one is simply to forklift this over to AWS. So maybe it's still everything on a single instance. You've got one EC2 instance. It's running the database and the application. But now we can start applying some best practices around that. We can use EBS volumes. We can do snapshots of those volumes. So now instead of completely losing everything, we can start dialing in our RTO and our RPO. So if it fails, we know, oh, it's only going to take us an hour or two to stand this back up. Yeah, it's not, it's not the best scenario, but it's better than what we had. And then moving beyond that, starting to look at um, now separating, so decoupling applications from database, for example, looking at the right choice for database, using RDS, for example, um, and splitting these things out. And then up here, we get to sort of this best model. And this is best in, 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 in my world right now. We've, we've actually taken an application. We've made it horizontally scalable so that it can automatically scale out based on some triggers. It's behind a load balance, or maybe we are using DNS. You know, we're also using Elastic Cache in here as a caching layer, and we're using RDS. So the, we very commonly see this, and that was the case with this application. They were, they were in a particular state here um, and wanted to move in this direction. Now, we don't often go from here to here. We're, we're not trying to boil the ocean when we come in and re-architect, you know, when we're proposing an architecture for somebody. We'll often understand that, okay, here's where we're at now. This is going to require a lot of work. You're going to have to go in and change code in your application, for example. Let's go here first. Let's, let's do a phased approach. Phase one, phase two, maybe a POC, where we'll come in and we'll do this. Either way, we want to be moving in this direction and going towards that, the ideal situation being that. In this particular case, though, um, we sort of had a combination. We could do a couple of things. And um, they were looking for the ability to, number one, have a shared environment where they had multiple customers um, running from a single set of databases, running the single application. Um, they also wanted this single tenant environment where they had their high-end customers who wanted dedicated environments for performance and perhaps compliance reasons. They wanted to compartmentalize them. They also wanted this hybrid approach, which was, um, OK, I want a single database on the back end, but I want to have custom front ends for each one of these. And so we worked with them to identify what their tenancy requirements were, what their recovery um, requirements were for this, and what type of uh, failover they wanted on the database. Um, in this case, with this commercial off the shelf, really in, in each one of these environments, you could only have one of them running at a time. So a singleton instance, as I mentioned. And we had a combination of, a, you, we could use auto recovery on EC2 to help with this, or an auto scaling group with, with one min and one max instances. Um, we also templatized all of this in Beanstalk to make it more cookie cutter for them. So as they wanted to add more single tenant environments, it was really just, okay, I need to instantiate, I, I've got a cloud formation template set up, let's go ahead and stand up another environment for them. Um, the, the nice thing about this, one of the side effects of splitting all this out, is now these environments can scale independent one of, an, of another. So um, my multi-tenant environment is probably going to scale differently than my single tenant environments. I can actually instantiate these with different size databases, different size EC2 instances, um, different triggers, then the same goes for this. Um, the end result, though, is, is putting this together on AWS and providing this infrastructure for them as part of their engagement with Rackspace. Um, we were able to help them automate all of this process. So now it wasn't, oh, my, I, I get an alarm, the system, uh, the system has gone down, I get an alarm, someone has to log in and fix this. We can actually automate all of this. So that now this is fairly, fairly self-healing. Um, and you minimize the amount of downtime for the customer and um, the amount of, of da potential data loss. Um, another case, and this is a little bit different, it's actually in the same space, but it's, it's a little bit different. Um, this is focused more around migration of existing applications and getting them running in the crowd, or getting them running in the cloud. 
um, a lot of times we're working with customers, as Tom mentioned, who they uh, either due to time constraints or resource constraints or just, again, they don't want to mow their lawn. They want someone to come el someone else to come in and provide that expertise for them. And so that, that I'm, I'm really just the tip of the iceberg in, in terms of the technical staff at, at Rackspace. I'm the solutions architect. I'm usually the first technical person that will engage with a customer. Behind me is really where all of the benefit comes from in terms of support and implementation. So I, I just help, I get the fun job where I get to go out and do all of these architectures and talk to customers about all the cool things they're doing. And then we have implementation teams that actually go and help the customers implement it, get it up and running, and then get it up and running and, and monitor it. Um, best practices and best, or best practices generally equals uh, better availability for customers. Um, this was an interesting, uh, so this is a different customer here. This is a little bit different, and it's not a typical architectural engagement. So in this case, we were working with a large enterprise scale customer. Um, they weren't particularly interested in architectural guidance from us. They already had a, uh, an AWS experience staff on hand, but they were having a particular problem that they wanted help and guidance with. And in this case, um, it was orphan EBS volume. How many of you know or have that, have you ever had that happen? Where you, you log into your account and all of a sudden you have hundreds of EBS volumes that are there, you have no idea what they are. Um, so in this case, they, at the end of every billing cycle, they called it EBS sprawl. So they had developers who were launching EC2 instances, attaching EBS volumes, terminating EC2 instances, and then not doing anything with the EBS volumes. So not automatically deleting them when the instance was terminated. And so they end up with all these orphaned EBS volumes. And we're talking, you know, on the order of hundreds or potentially thousands of these. And they had no real way of managing it. Um, they didn't have the ability, they didn't have the process in place to tag these EBS volumes or to monitor how, how large or how many of those were, were occurring. And so they asked us to come in and help them establish a process and procedure for managing this. And, and this really involved two separate steps. The first was taking care of the existing EBS volume sprawl that they had, so helping them to write scripts to go out, identify which EBS volumes were attached to EC2 instances, go back through um, logs to determine who owned or launched those instances, and then cut tickets into their internal system that would then generate tasks for individuals to go off and research and figure out who belonged to each one of those orphaned EBS um, volumes. The second step was the creation of EBS Lambda, or, or of Lambda function, custom Lambda functions, then to manage these going forward to enforce some level of compliance. So to make sure that when an EC2 instance was launched that the EBS volumes attached to it had the correct tagging associated with it. So it had an environment, a, um, a department, an owner, that sort of thing. So establish this going forward. And that's one of the other things that we've provided in this case is sort of that um, enterprise scale process and automation um, for for companies that are actually growing to the point where they need that. In this case, it's something they definitely wanted to do, but they didn't want to spend their time right then working on it and fixing it. Um, that's it as far as case studies. I don't know where we're at. The timer wasn't started, so I'm not sure how far I, how far I got. Um, any questions about uh, case studies, architecture, um, anything at all on the technical side? You can either ask, we can either ask now, or we can, we can do it later on. And don't be bashful. Anything as deep tech as you want, you have access to a solution architect that you don't have to pay for. The only price tag is you have to say it in front of all your peers yeah. here, which is a little, maybe awkward. Any questions for us? What can we help you with? Do you want to take yeah, sure. So the question is, um, uh, do we use uh, exclusively AWS services for things like single sign-on or um, uh, other applications? I mean, and the answer is, I mean, generally, 
for when we're working with customers and custom, customer architectures, it's, it's generally whatever AWS provides or third-party software that's available. So if you want to do single sign-on, um, if you want to federate to AWS, we'll use AWS. <coughs> excuse me. We'll use AWS to the extent that we can. Now, on our side, internally, we have our own mechanisms that allow us to do that with our AWS account. So when you log in, when you log in to your Rackspace account, mm -hmm. we're federating your credentials over to AWS. So we're using some code that we wrote to do that. But for your applications, we'll use whatever else is available to us. And we, we leverage that internal code that we've developed, too. Yeah, we, we have a tool called Passport that basically mm -hmm. what it does is when you, we, like I mentioned earlier, we like to manage environments and we think it's best practice to manage uh, AWS at the environment level, not at the account level. So you'll have multiple accounts under management with Rackspace. What that means for, for this particular example is you provide your credentials for those accounts, we encrypt them, we store them away in a secure vault, and when you log in, you basically log into our console. Now, the question I almost always get back in that is, oh, you skin the AWS UI. Not at all. What we're doing is providing your access to instances and your access to your environment. But we believe there's a lot of richness in the AWS console and that we believe that really customers aren't looking for us to make that simpler. They're looking for us to uh, help them ingest how to use it better, help them leverage the power of it. Don't abstract it, just make it, make it something where you can guide us through the usage of it. So a, a really common experience would be, uh, since the best practice within AWS is to have every account be basically a physical boundary between workloads. Like I would have a, a dev account, a prod account for a workload. I might even have a test, kind of depending on how you do things. Uh, so you're gonna have three sets of credentials and ultimately, ma credential management becomes a problem if you're implementing that best practice. That's why we created Passport. You log into the Rackspace console, we manage all of your credentials on the back end. Makes it easier for you to manage. Another big benefit, like I mentioned earlier, was when we think about our other management tools, since we want to help you manage the environment level, not the account level, then having that account federation allows you to get unified views across tools like I mentioned Compass earlier. So if you're sysadmins, if you decide that you want to manage it yourself, or our admins, we can do this work for you as well, to look across everything in one unified view. And you can sort by severity and then take action based on that. So I mean, it's, it's kind of a yes and no. It really yeah. depends. Like Within your application, do you want to do SSO like back to like a corporate directory? Like that, you have to build yourself because we don't push into the application layer. But are we making it easier for you to work with AWS because the proliferation of credentials? We do solve that kind of problem. Does that answer your question? Not, so again, not directly. So we, we'd look at whatever whatever um, AWS provides in terms of temporary credentials, that sort of thing, uh, allowing those users to federate. But we'd also look at third-party software that's out there too. Did we get all the way there now? We're going to answer okay. this question the whole way. We'll get there. Okay. What else can we answer for you? I, I can feel this one. So, and, and I think the last part of what you just said actually nailed it for us. What we do is we have ProServe in-house, and then we also have a stable of partners that when things get really hairy, so we, we are a big believer in having the right people do the right job. We know what we're great at. We know what we have DNA in. We know where we have pattern recognition. When, for simple jobs, for small scale jobs, I would say ranging up to what, I mean, a, a generic medium scale migration that's nothing too crazy. We'll probably do it in-house with our own ProServe. But if it's something that's really hairy where we feel like we need to bring in somebody who's a specialist when it comes to migrations, we'll bring in that specialist, but your experience won't change. Because we still manage the project soup to nuts regardless of who is doing the work on the back end. So we have a small stable of partners we really trust when things get super crazy with migration that we'll bring in, but yet your customer experience doesn't change. I think that's a big part of our deal and that ultimately we don't want to have the customer have to fall through the cracks with multiple vendors. 
we want to take all that work on ourselves and be your single point of contact. It's also really consistent with AWS's philosophy on resellers, or even in their own documentation. Basically, the end-to-end -end customer experience is the responsibility of whoever the reseller is, and we're a reseller along with an MSP, so that's, we, we work within that philosophy for migration. Yeah, it really could be either, and it, it's it's a gray answer because everybody's different. They're really, it'd be very tough to codify like above 300 servers, we won't do it, because if they're all cookie cutter and there's a high level of automation already in place in a different form, easy. I mean, the situation I described like never happens, uh, but it really, there's, a, there's so many variables in there. That's why migration is always a pro-serve deal, because there's no such thing as a cookie cutter migration. I don't, what, what do you think about that statement? Yeah, I, that's generally our approach to it. So when we're talking about migration, especially data migration, for example, um, you know, our, our team won't migrate that data for you. On a small scale, I mean, if we're talking real small scale, I mean, I'll tell you what you need to do. Okay, you need to use the database migration service. You can accomplish that here. You go here, you click that button, you point it at this RDS instance, you click that button, and you're done. But really, then, it's, it's the customer who's actually doing the migration. We're just providing migration guidance to them. And, and I'll do that on, on small to medium scales, you know, types of migrations where, okay, here, we need to move X, Y, and Z. Okay, you can use these services. And depending on the skill level, the expertise, and the comfort level of the customer, they are more than happy to do that. If they don't have that skill level, if they don't have that expertise, then we're, we're definitely going to, to look at a pro server partner type yeah. engagement, as Tom mentioned. It, and I guess it makes sense at a higher level, like we find the customers that really have a lot of success with AWS are outcomes focused. So a, a lot of what we find when we're dealing with sales cycles is those who want to talk a ton about like, let's, Let's get into exactly what the inputs are. Generally, is a kind of a stranger conversation because if you're focused on what your, your business outcome is, it's much, much easier just to define outcomes, handle the sausage making in the middle, however deeply the customer wants to get into it, cool, but clearly defined inputs that are, that are almost exclusively focused on translating into business outcomes, that's our sweet spot. That's the kind of customer that really does good things with AWS. Okay, other questions? I, saw, I thought I saw a hand over there earlier. Unless the length of our answer has scared anyone else from answering yeah. questions. <laughs> anyone else? We, we've got time, we're, uh, we're happy to be here. How about we do this? Uh, we'll wrap up the group session. Thank you very much for coming, we really appreciate it. If there's any more questions we can answer for you, don't hesitate. We've got a big booth in the, uh, in, what, what is it, 109? We've got swag for you as well. I, I think we have good swag. I'm a little biased, but I think it's good. Uh, we'd be happy to give you some of that, and we have some of our solution architects at the booth to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with you about your needs, so please come see us. Thanks a lot for coming. We'll stick around up here if you have any one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. questions, so come on down. Thanks again. Thanks a lot.